I'd like to progress without any further ado to uh, introduce Paul Gallagher, who's been a contributor to On Landscape in the past. He's the uh, co-founder of Aspect to Eye, some uh, fantastic photography workshops, and also the Epson Print Academy, which uh, I think started out, I'm right, in saying it was a, just how to use a printer and it expanded into a whole workflow it system was, yeah, of was, yeah. uh, running printers. So um, I'll pass it over to Paul. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Is that cl crystal clear? I don't normally have problems with microphones and me voice, to be honest with you. But, um, I want to thank the On Landscape team for inviting me in the first place. I mean, it's always a pleasure to get together with a group of like-minded people and certainly to meet up, meet up with old chums, because I mean, most of us are around the world and all over the place. We don't often get a chance to see each other. And I think it's good that we're going to have a good few days. The speakers are so varied and so different. And I think it's going to be absolutely brilliant. And long may it continue. Hopefully, there'll be another one next year or the year after, whenever. Um, transitions. What's transitions all about? I think a really important bit in photography, certainly for me, is not going stagnant. I mean, I'm probably known for black and white work, and I've been doing black and white work for 30 years, and predominantly in large format. And the one thing I, I dislike intensely as a photographer is kind of lose your way, lose your passion, lose your drive for photography. And the thing for me is to allow yourself to be a bit free and go through transitions and change the way your photography goes. I look at my work from 10 years ago um, with some of like my first book, Aspects of Expression. It's an entirely different body of work now. And I think that's because I'm allowing myself to go through individual transitions over the years. And, and recently, I've gone through another set of transitions, certainly the last three or four years. And the two main things are, is embracing digital. I mean, for many years, I shot film, printed in dark rooms, and then I went through a transition of shot film, processed it, scanned it, and printed it digitally. That was a transition for me. And now, a, a transition I'm going through now is embracing digital. When I'm running workshops with Aspect 2 I, everyone's using DSLRs. When I first ran workshops years ago, about 1% of people when they were first coming out with DSLRs were using DSLRs. Everyone's using them now. And as the technology's got better and better, I've started embracing using DSLRs or, or digital, different digital formats. And it's been fantastic to see people's work using them. The other thing with using DSLRs, it's different from using five foot black and white because you choose the outcome of your work when you purchase the black and white film. It's going to be a black and white picture, ultimately, at the end. Um, with digital, when I first started using digital, the first time I encountered the image was in front of me. It was colour. It was a colour raw file. Now, I'd not got myself stuck in a rut with black and white. I'm still considering myself a black and white photographer. But the one thing that digital did to me, or allowed me to explore, was the fact when I was looking at the colour file, there was sprinklings of colour in it. And when I first started using it, I just converted to black and white, and that's all I did. And I followed the same mode and converted to black and white. Used some of the colour information to create black and white images, and I enjoyed doing that. But there was bound to be a time when I was looking at the work and I was thinking, do you know what, I don't want to kind of extract that colour detail, I don't want to get rid of it, I actually want to use it. And albeit very subtly and very slowly, this started creeping in. And I started exploring this transition in my work, in my particular photography. Right, let's see if this pointer works. Now, this is probably, you know, the other thing that digital does, well, just two things actually, it gives you a much lighter bag to carry around than five foot. And the other thing it does is enables you to work slightly quickly, slightly more quickly. I mean, there's no dispute in the fact that setting up a large format camera isn't a, you know, a one, two minute process, it takes its time. Um, but even working with digital to this day, I still, I'm still kind of fixed in the mode of working with 5.4. I mean, 5.4, 10 exposures a day, probably max, maybe 15 of us pushing the boat out. And I still work in the same mode with, in the di with, with digital cameras. And I enjoy doing that, that's no bad thing. And you know what I often say to people when I'm teaching photography and lecturing, you know, if you get back and you've got 500 files, from a day, or 300 files from a day, your raw files, and you look at them on your computer and you go, that one's great. Do you know what, you'll have no idea how you got it. I think it's worth taking less, and that's still something I endorse from the 5.4 days when I was shooting 5.4 all the time. 
But this, this particular image was an example of where digital lent itself to me. It was a good thing. I was out there, I was teaching a large format. It was a one-to-one -one large format, one-to-one. -to -one. I was in Hodge Close in the Lake District. And uh, I'd seen this arrangement of trees quite a few times. And it's right near the car park. You pull your car on park up, and this arrangement of trees is in front of you. And the arrangement is, is beautiful to me. It's one large tree in the centre of the smaller trees either side, almost given like a triangular shape. So I love the idea, I love the composition. But the problem I always was, was the background. It's a, it's a slate working. So the background is terribly cluttered. It's old buildings, it's piles of slate, and it never, ever, ever worked as a picture. Although the trees, the arrangement of trees was beautiful. Now, we were working in the, in the slate workings, and we were taking lots of different compositions and working nice and slow with 5-4. And it was about mid to late afternoon, and this thick mist came in right over the whole quarry. And I was looking across at the set of trees, and as it was approaching the trees, there became a time whereby it swallowed up the background. And then, for that moment alone, I was on, I don't often take pictures on work, so this one particular situation, I said, do you mind if I just go and get this photograph? Because this is absolutely fine. It was a one-off. It was I'd never seen it before, and I set up the camera. And just before it engulfed the trees, the mist, I managed to get the picture. And the one thing it took, I converted it to black and white. I had every intention of, but the one thing it showed me is that working a little bit quickly, a little bit more quickly, with digital, paid off, paid big, big dividends. Now. Oh, it's done too. It's not me, Tim. No. Technology. Technology. Now, working with black and white, a lot of black and white, obviously you've got no colour information to rely on. Nothing. So we, we see in colours, as David was talking about earlier on, working for such a long time in black and white, you can't rely on colour. Uh, so it's form, line, texture, shape, weight, balance. These are all things in black and white that are critically important. And pre-visualising in black and white was a skill I picked up many, many years ago through, purely through shooting so many or exposing so many sheets of film with the full intention of making it a black and white picture. Um, now, one of the places I started working digitally was quite a few years ago when I first went to Iceland. I started working digitally. And I also started kind of experimenting with bits of colour. It was in Iceland, certainly the southern coast of Iceland. Which lent itself to it because a lot of the southern coast of Iceland is pretty much monochrome anyway, so I felt quite safe with the whole thing, you know. It wasn't too bad, it wasn't too scary for me, you know. Um, and once again, if you look at it, form, line, texture, shapes, I mean, like you've got the kidney bowl shape in the middle, middle portion of the frame. It's, this is the, just outside Vic in the distance, the basaltic columns of Vic. And there's strong wind coming in off the Atlantic, as it often does in Iceland came whipping through, it rippled all the pool there, and the, this is an intertidal zone. And these sands, these soil sands, uh, are very black, it's all volcanic, it's all volcanic ash and rock and stuff. And so, these very, very dark shapes are the side, with this sweeping pattern going through the frame, leading out to almost the columns of the distance, was what I pre-visualised at the time. And the, the water, or the seawater, was retreating, and the thing that capped it off for me was just this wet area of sand where, as the water retreated, left a sequence of patterns. So it was very much just relying on black and white form, line, and texture and shapes. Will we do two or one? Oh, it stopped. Brilliant. You know, in Iceland, um, these areas of Iceland are fantastic. A lot of people, you know, get off the plane at Reykjavik and then they go to like. Vic, and then they hurtle along and go to Yokelsal and explore Yokelsal. And the iconic places are without doubt fantastic places. They're beautiful, and then we're going to see some images in a minute where I've been to these places and explored and enjoyed photographing them. But the thing that has still fascinated me was when the areas of land between the iconic locations are kind of flatlands, almost you know, unassuming. Um, there's no big structures there, there's no big mountains and stuff like that. But it's fascinating to go into them and explore them and wander around, get out and walk out, get out the car and walk around and walk for miles. And you get these vast areas of black soil, once again, because it's volcanic. And you get these areas also of grasslands, yellow grasslands. And 
punctuated through us some of the, the odd startings of new grasslands that they started to sort of colonise the area and, and grow and build up and build up. The other thing I love about Iceland as well um, is, is the storms that come off the Atlantic. The weather's constantly transient, it's changing all the time, it never stands still. And, you know, Dave was talking about, you know, dawn and dusk and them kind of lights at the end of the day. I've never been a lover of dawn and dusk photographs, personally. I know they are the golden hours, but certainly in terms of colour, I mean, it's, it's, it's not for me. I'd prefer to be out on days where it's almost stormy. You know, I like to be just before, just after the storm, or basically stood underneath the storm, quite frankly. I love muted days where the light's very, very diffused and it's quite overcast. And this is a classic example of that. You know, I've been wandering around these grasslands and it was right on the edge. You can see the yellow line. That's right on the edge of a big open spans of, of yellow grasslands going out to the distance with just a peninsula in the top right under the frame. Well, I think the thing that topped the whole thing off for me was just a storm coming in. And these storms happen all the time. They change. And it's, it's a bit like Scotland. Scotland's like that. Very, very transient light. But moving on to uh, to Yokel Salem, it's the, people. I've heard a few people say, you know, you go to Yokel Salem, you're bound to get a good photograph. Uh, no, you'll get a photograph of ice on a beach, but I don't necessarily think it makes a brilliant photograph. It's actually quite a tricky location to work. It's very monochromatic. This is actually a colour photograph, believe it or not, it is colour. So I told you to tiptoed into it very slowly, didn't I? Um, yeah, this is my first exploration of colour, as you can see. Uh, no, I had to take me time to get used to these things. Um, and I was walking along the beach. And was, when you go to the first obvious locations, there's a lot of pebbles and shale and stuff. And when the water comes in and out, and it comes in, approaches and retreats, it looks kind of chaotic. And part of what we do as landscape photographers, to a degree, is try and make order out of chaos. And um, the other thing that's difficult on these beaches is that the ice is thrown up and dumped on the beach. If anyone doesn't know how the ice gets there, there's, there's a big glacier that comes down. There's a glacial lagoon, co lagoon called Lo Yokel Solon Lagoon. The front of the glacier carves off big icebergs. I mean, huge things the size of a house. They bob around in the lagoon for a period of time, and then when they get warm, they break up. And then there's a channel that goes out, and they pass out through this channel and end up in the Atlantic, and they get smashed to pieces. And when the, when the tide comes in, they put these lumps of ice on the beach, they lay them down. And I, I was wandering around looking for a piece of ice that looked kind of clean. I know it sounds like, you know, a bit prescriptive, but the thing being is that the winds near the Atlantic, the winds pick up this black sand. And these pieces of ice look very dirty and the black sand sticks them and it doesn't look particularly attractive. But what I wanted to do is, is get something that had been newly deposited, and that's what this was. So it was a timing with the tides, it was waiting, it was being quite, getting the right position on the beach. And this had just been dropped down. And the tide was going out, gradually going out. And I wanted deliberately an image of two arms. I mean, people say, you know, people look at it and always go, is that, in, is that the same photograph? You put that in there. You're like, I've dropped it in Photoshop or something like that. It's the, same, it's the same photograph, obviously, but this was in the fore, this piece, it was about this, this size here, in the foreground, sat on the clean sand. And I wanted it to look like a jewel in a jeweler's shop in black velvet. That was the whole idea of the thing. But I also wanted a representation of the environment from which it came, which was the Atlantic in the distance. And we can also see, as after this was deposited, there was another piece of ice put down afterwards. And once again, ideal conditions for me with the storm clouds and, um, and the passing weather coming over again. Now this was incredibly difficult to capture. The reason being is that these things move, and they move a lot. They move a heck of a lot in the water. You can walk up to them and kick them, and it feels like a lump of granite. And you think, that's never going to move, that. But they do, they float, they're quite, they're quite dynamic. I was using a DSLR with, with 24mm tilt and shift lens. You can imagine the situation. I had a, I had a 0 0.3 ND in there to like smooth the water out slightly. I had a graduated filter in the sky. So everything's kind of focused, position got ready. And you get this kind of, I had this, the idea of the water coming past the lump pieces of ice on the smooth black sand. You know, typical of this in particular environment, what it delivers to you. 
So that all separates the pieces of ice, and then I'll make the exposure and it'll go fine. But to do this, you have to work in the area where the waves are coming in. So the waves are coming round your knees almost, going up and going back out to sea. And that's the only way. I wanted the idea of the image was the energy of the place. It's a very energetic place. It's the Atlantic, so it's incredibly energetic. And I'd set up the camera and I thought, right, wait for the waves to come in. And the waves came in and what happened to me composition was they all got up and moved around like this. I repositioned themselves. So it was, it was immense frustration. So I thought, right, I'll move the camera and I'll refocus and get the grad right. I thought, I'll wait for the next wave. Should be fine. Just ready to hit the, sh hit the shutter. The wave comes in and they all move around like this and reposition themselves. So it was a constant source of frustration. Um, but after a while, with a bit of patience, it paid off. And, and I, got the, I got the composition, the exact image that I wanted. Incidentally, incidentally, it's quite dangerous working in these environments. Just prior to this, a bit further down the beach, I was, I was doing some more exposures. And... Um, I'd, I'd gone quite away into the water, the tripod was, was set in the water, and I was, I was got, you know, kind of focused on one particular subject matter in front of me. And this wave come in, and the subject matter luckily then didn't move, but what I didn't realise is that a lump of this ice behind, about the size of a small car, did move. And it rolled and hit the back of my leg and my tripod. And these, these things weigh a heck of a lot, you know, so... The, but they're constantly, constantly in motion. The reason why I put this in, I know it's, uh, it's another image of ice on the Oakle Salem, is that the other image was taken a couple of years ago, and this one was taken this year. And the, the denser the ice is, um, the bluer it becomes. And, this was, this, and the thing I loved about this was that the colour of the ice was really apparent. The sky was a beautiful silvery, silvery grey, which is, as you know, is something I love. And we almost got that kind of aquamarine in the sea. So you've got these wonderful, strong colours. So you can see how the introduction of colours moved on. There's more coming out, you know. It's gradually but surely building up. You know, the blues and the ice are coming out. Um, we're pushing the boat out here. This is real blue, this is. Um, we, <laughs> Iceland's fantastic look. I love going to Iceland, it's an amazing place. Once again, Lafote, and I know David uh, has enjoyed Lafote for quite a few years, and, and I've been quite a few times myself, and um, this particular, we've been staying in a village not so far, it was me and Michael Pilgrim spent out here for quite, a, quite some time, getting some images, and um, we came across this, which was amazing. The idea of the colour in the image, which I, I, I didn't mute down at all, is that it was clearly bitterly cold. I mean, incredibly cold conditions at the time of year we were there. They were getting hit by blizzards all the time, and sometimes you could barely drive because the snowfall was so intense, and the winds as well were very, very intense. But this is, what this is, is it, um, it's a fjord, but it's a tidal fjord. So effectively what happens is, is that the tide comes in and goes back out again. Um, but what happens with the ice is, as, as the tide level rises in the night time, the temperatures drop, and the surface of the, the fjord freezes. But it's not like it's not like freshwater ice. It's just it's not really brittle and sharp like glass. It's quite malleable. It's it's quite fibrous. It's it's quite unusual. But as the morning approaches, the tide goes out and the ice is laid down on the boulder fields. And as it does, as the, as, as the angle of the ice lay, laying itself down becomes extreme, it forms these cracks. And we've been over the far side of, of the, the fjord and dri driven right the way round. And now we, we, had, we were working in complete shadow, which was amazing. And we could see these, and I was saying, I thought to myself, this is fantastic. You know, we kind of have these cracks in this ice. I just I really want to make some compositions of this. I want to make some exposure of this. Um, but the problem being was that these, aren't, these cracks aren't right on the edge, where the edge of the fjord is. That's not the case. The cracks are kind of midway out. That is the problem. And towards the edge of where, where there's kind of some quite big pools is, is frozen areas. But the ice is really quite thick, three or four inches thick. And I, I, remember I said to Michael, I said, I'll never forget the way, I said to Michael, I said, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and photograph them things. And we pulled over and got, got out the car and went down. I said, I'm going to photograph them cracks in the ice. i never forget what Michael said to me. He said, uh, 
good luck with that one, I'm staying here. <laughs> and he, he, he never went out there, and I don't blame him, actually. So I got my kit, and I got these big ice spikes on, uh, a tripod kit, and, and walked out. And these kind of plates of ice, where the deep water is on the edge of the fjord, um, well, they're about two metres in diameter, they're kind of circular slabs of ice, and I'm walking across them, and you can feel these things doing that. And you don't quite know how deep the water is below. The one thing you do know is that it's really cold. And you're walking across it, and I was getting more and more concerned, you know, because no one's ever called me twinkle toes. And so these things were moving like this. And what I don't know, anyway, I made my way over to them, luckily enough. I think Michael's got a photograph of me on them somewhere. But I made my way over to them. Got this set of expo, wait for about 45 minutes. And um, I got like a yip moment. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Got the image in the bag. I loved it. I was really, really pleased. And then I got my kit on, and then a point of realization hit me that actually I've got to walk through that ice back, you know. And I've got to walk back through the ice. When the sun's been getting higher in the sky and it's actually been warming up, and it was a bit of a worry. But luckily enough, I made it back and I survived the ordeal. It's true dedication, that, in landscape photography, you know. Threatening your life. Um, the, you know, the, the beauty of Lafoten is, is boundless. I mean, it's just staggering. I mean, just I love the place. And, you know, it is a lot of Norway, to be honest. And um, I'd, this was the place called Myland on the Lafoten Island. And it's one of them places you go back to places and you enjoy visiting them and stuff. And, and the, the beauty of this was that, once again, we were in shadow on this side, but the, the late evening light was just picking off, picking off the snow-capped mountains coming out the fjord in the distance. And, um, and the composition straight is this kind of sweep of sandy beach. Not a bucket and spade in sight. A sweep of sandy beach going away. And then and just the mountains in the distance. I elected to do a long exposure on this for the, for the simple reason that, uh, obviously, the, the, the sky was blue, so everything was very blue, which represented the cold. It was incredibly cold. Um, but uh, the thing that fascinated me was, as we got the light on the mountains in the distance, the waves that were coming towards the beach in the centre of the frame, the heart of the photograph, it reflected that warm light. And I, I had this kind of vision of the whole of the image, having, having like a warm heart to the centre of the image, and cold in this cold environment. And to photograph it ordinarily with a short exposure, the water would have been quite chaotic, and that kind of warm glow was broken up. So I ended up, but it was like a little stop. I don't think it was a big stop, but I put it, I put it along an, an ND on it just to smooth it out and to get that warm glow in the centre of the frame. But either side of this is the old fish racks, but they're not ones that are used. They're actually abandoned and they're broken up. So in terms of making shapes and textures and structures, it's fantastic. It's a beautiful place. There are, there are situations whereby, um, you know, nature delivers you a, a real stunner, you know, and, and you get something that you think, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely chuffed with it, I'm, I'm, I think it's fantastic. We were staying in a place called Balstad, it's like a kind of little fishing village thing, and um, God, we have snow, I mean, blizzard snow, I mean, they seem to be coming about every 45 minutes, stopping and then they come back again, and it was... It was, you know, we were a bit concerned about, about the gear, actually, you know, the equipment and would it work and something, getting it wet and all that. But the other thing we, are, we were mostly concerned about was the mode of transport that we got. Because when we arrived at the airport, we kind of hired like a mid-range car or whatever it was, and they provided us with a car called the Nissan Note. <laughs> Anyone's ever seen one of these? It's like a bubble car that your gran goes to as to get a groceries in. It's not exactly four by four Arctic transport, really. <laughs> Um, but luckily enough, with, with Norwegian law, it, it is that they've got to have steel studs on the tyres to get you around. And this thing got us everywhere. It was unbelievable. You know, how, how versatile this little vehicle was. I did manage to put it in the ditch, though. I didn't tell the insurance company, but because I got it out. So it got towed out by a local, which is quite good. But anyway, these blizzards were coming in and out. And as we know, you know snow... It's a, it's, a, it's a treat when you get it, you know. And snow transforms a landscape. It simplifies the landscape massively. And because everything's kind of muted white. And 
we didn't go to like the big mountain areas in, in Lofoten, like you know, a lot of people go into the big mountains or the edge of the coast where they're, you know, they're all covered in snow. It, we were, I was kind of drawn to go to the areas that were kind of more unassuming, you know, just the small farming areas where there was like, you know, um, like telegraph poles, you know, fences, little trees, barns, things like that. I quite enjoyed just doing something really simple. And because I was kind of influenced by the snow, the simplification process kicked in. You get into certain zones, and, and I, I thought I was really fascinated by how simple everything became. And the simplicity is self-explanatory. You know, just a fence going from one side of the frame to the other. A small rise in the landscape, and the two trees just pinnacled on the top. It was so simple. And some people have asked me, you know, why did you include so much grey sky? I mean, the, the large proportion of the image is grey sky. And the reason why I did is that this was another storm coming in, another big storm approaching. And when this happens, the first thing we do as human beings is any big storm, we tend to look up and look at the storm coming towards us. And I made it predominant in the image, the, the sky, because that's what it was like. It was quite ominous coming towards. And the, the size of the big grey sky, for me, kind of accentuated the fragility of the fence and the trees, which very soon were going to be subjected to another, another battering. But, I mean, the whole environment, on that particular day, the simplification process was pushed further and further and further. And it was, it was things like, like these fences. Sometimes the fences, because of the drifts, came out the snow and went back down into the snow. So it was just, you know, I say about black and white, these are all digital converted to black and white. It was about form, line and texture and shapes. And I had a field day. And everyone's probably gone into a certain landscape with their camera. And we all have days where we go, I can't see anything. I'm not getting any worse at that. We all do that. Even I do it after all these years, quite frighteningly frequently, actually. Do that. Uh, but we also have times where we go out with our cameras, go into the environment and we go, this is all snapping together. We go beyond looking at things. We start seeing things. So by seeing things, we bear relations with, relationships with them. They make sense to us. And this all started coming together in this particular place. And it's just a line of fence posts going up. And as the, the line of fence posts line up with each other, it's dark and it just zips off the edge of the frame. And once again, open space, you know, I mean, don't... You know, there's nothing wrong with doing these things. It's experimental. We're talking about transitions in me today. Just let it go. I just enjoyed myself, you know. In terms of 5.4, some of these images I probably would, never would have gotten 5.4. I probably wouldn't have attempted them on 5.4. This was, um, was one of them things that was absolutely fascinating. Quite a shock, actually. The day before... I'd, I'd driven past this lake, and the day before, um, the lake was like, it was, it was frozen and flat. It's like somebody painted it white. And um, it was featureless. It deserved a fleeting glance and nothing more, enough to register the fact that it was flat and frozen. And I drove off. The next morning, I was coming back, um, and I looked, the road went over a brow, and as I looked down on this lake, what nature, the forces of nature, and, uh, and, and what nature had created was so, so fascinating. These shapes, the ice started breaking up on, on, the, center, on, on the surface of the lake. And it's the, the variations of it were fascinating to me. Um, the, you've got the darker breakage in the, in, in, in the ice and the surface of the ice was really thick ice. And the water had pushed up and gone either side. And so you've got that kind of grey line. Where the grey line's really wide, at the bottom of the frame, that's a thin crack in the ice. And the water laps up and seeps along. But, it's, but the thing that was fascinating to me is that there's, there, was, there was kind of a rhythm and an order to it, but also a complete randomness to it as well. And it, you beg so many questions about, what, well, how's nature done this? What's created this? Obviously, it's a thawing process, but why the lines? Why the shapes? And why are they formed in that way? And... It's, when you, it, I love the, fasc the fascinating part is when you've got the central crack going through the centre of the frame and either side, that's obviously interrupted the one that goes diagonally and that had spread out wider. So these shapes were everywhere and I'd spent a good hour or so just spending my time photographing these things. But the other thing that's kind of missing from the photograph in a way is the sense of scale. 
And that middle crack going up that goes right off the centre of the frame is about a kilometre long. This is a huge environment. And it looks like I could have took it at my feet, but it's not. This is a massive span to frozen lake. This is the one that's hanging in the foyer up there. Um, and I, this is a, this the mountains of Flagstad in the distance. And we, we, we all get pictures where you think, you know, that works, that's okay, that's fine. You get one, you think, that really has, for me, personally, has come together. And this was one of them, this was one of them pictures that it had come together. I was, um, I've been there so many times, this uh, the area around Flagstad in Lofoten, and stood on this particular place, and I go back to it every time. You get a favourite location, you go back, you go back. I was saying to someone in the break not so long ago, you know, never consider an area as done. It's not. I mean, you know, it's it, it, at every area, you go back to the seasons, the weather changes, the light changes, nothing's ever done, you know. I mean, so, I mean, and this is the same for me for Lafoten. I go back all the time and I find even the same location delivers me entirely different things. And that's what this had done. I've, I've never seen it like this. When I've been there in the past, it had always been the winter time. Those being bitterly cold. The foreground was invisible to me because it was covered in ice and snow. And in fact, it was a nightmare to navigate, walk across because, you know, you didn't know where the pools were going to be. Um, but when I went back, it was like, it was a completely new experience because there was no snow. Hardly any on the mountains in the distance, maybe a little powdering, but not much at all. And so the experience was entirely different. The colours were the first thing that struck me, the beauty of the colours. Above me was like a pale kind of cyan blue sky, um, mottled with clouds and different passing clouds. And that was reflected in the foreground pools, these kind of, the blues. Also picking off the edge of the pools was the yellow, the sunlight. When I first arrived there, the sunlight was far too dominant. I was almost pointing towards the sun, which you can see the upper left on the mountains. And I knew this isn't going to work. This is not going to come off. I'm not going to be successful with this. But part of being a landscape photographer, two things you take your time patience and the other thing is being an amateur meteorologist i mean try and understand what the weather's going to do and out towards the open sea there was clouds coming across and slowly but surely gathering coming forward and my fear was that you know they could help me in terms of bringing the dynamic range the, you know the exposure down i could have cranked a load of filters in front but it would look damned horrible and ugly you know um so i wanted to use nature's own force which is the clouds what we fear was, would the clouds come in, as is quite common with Lofoten, and will they cover the mountains altogether and have lost it? So it became a cat and mouse and wait and patience and almost self-control, actually. And as the, as the clouds came across and came across, they just soaked up the sun, just enough to bring the dynamic range down. I still had to use a grad, obviously, but they just soaked it up enough. But I had to be quite quick in working because I didn't want them to soak up the sun in, in its entirety because I liked the recession of the mountains in the top left-hand corner. That was perfect. But everything came together just with that little bit of patience and that just paying off. And the, the colours, in, as I say, in the sea and the blues and even the seaweeds that were kind of an orangey-brown was, was just an amazing, amazing afternoon. But you know what? I know... <laughs> Oh, there's, see, there's two at once. There we go. The, um, the, the one thing that I never get fed up with is Scotland. I never will get fed up with Scotland. Somebody said to me, not so long, if you had three days to live with a camera, where would you go? And I said, Scotland. And I mean it now. I've travelled a heck of a lot now with cameras, and, and I still love the place. And it's a bit like, you know, ice on the phone. It's transient. The light's transient. Um, um, the seasons affect it and, and alter it, and it's different every time I go. There's always something to explore, and there's a vast wealth of photography in Scotland even now. Um, the, the, this, this picture was the composition's quite straightforward. I mean, it's this blades of rock going like that, and then there's the beautiful kind of mottled blue, blues and greens in the sea, and in the top you've got the broken peninsula, which almost looks like it's snapped off and this great bit of warm sunlight. So everything, the, the, the time at that particular coastline was really, really good. Um, but the, one of the challenges was, well, first challenge was getting on these rocks, because it was like walking on oil. You were sliding everywhere. I mean, the to position yourself was a nightmare. Um, but secondly, from a distance, I'd seen this, this happening. 
Well, when I went there, um, I was aware of two things. The tide was coming in. And the second thing I was aware of was that this had to happen again. Because if it didn't, the foreground of the image would just look brown rock. And the, the actual, the picking out delineation of all of these individual blades of rock wouldn't happen. You wouldn't see it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be in existence in the foreground. Which meant patience had to wait. And that to, once again, in a sense, wait for nature to do its own thing. And I'd set up the camera, everything was ready to go. Well, the biggest problem on the day was sea spray. This, this was, this, the, the winds were really, really driving in. And the filters were getting covered in sea spray constantly. And I'm sure, as you all know, you can go like that and wipe your filters. And they might look dry, but dry doesn't mean clear. You hold them on, it looks like you're looking through a net curtain, you know. So sea spray is a major problem. And starting to get solutions out in this environment was a nightmare. So the only thing I had to do, the other problem I had actually, incidentally, was the tide was coming in. So I thought to myself, I'm running out of time. So I had to set up the camera on the kind of landscapes there and then put me back to the landscape and just wait for the right moment. And when you, you obviously it's a bit of a matter of time, and as the wave was coming in, it kind of round your feet, and you go out and take the frame. But with the frustrating bit is that each one of the individual blades of rock, the separation of which was going to be depicted by the foam, well, I had to get foam formed in each one, which was a bit of a tall order to ask nature, but I had to be patient about it. And I took a few of them, went, it's going to happen now. And I took the picture, and only one or two of them. And I said, oh, how frightfully unfortunate. Or words to that effect. <laughs> a few times. Um, and then, after about five minutes, just before it was getting slightly unworkable, actually, because the tide was really coming in, um, I, I managed to get the exposure that I wanted. But in terms of the Scottish coastline, and the energy of the Scottish coastline, and them little hints of colour, it was a great, great day. Right. I was just waiting for it to move on to them. Um, I'll put this in because compositionally it was a challenge. This is an old fishing station in Lofoten. And I'd kind of, I've been around this, right, right down this kind of little beaten track, and right at the very end we found it. And a number of different things, a number of different elements of the composition came to play. If you stand, you stop, you go beyond looking at things, you see things, and you think, I need to, I had a number of different elements that I wanted to put in, in the composition itself. If it doesn't work, then the only thing you're left to do is remove some of them to simplify it to make it come together. The idea was the boardwalk, the bleach boardwalk, the tonality in that, the textures in it were fantastic. Um, the reflection from the mountains was really important to me. I, I loved it. I could see it, but it was really, really important to me. And lastly, the girders coming out from the broken jetty side. The whole thing would shattered and fallen to pieces, but these girders were quite graphic. And so I needed to bring these individual elements together. Um, and I had to move the camera. With, I want the spikes pushed into the wood of the, of, the, um, of the boardwalk there, the wooden boardwalk. And I thought quite arrogantly, aggressively, I have the boardwalk going right across the frame. Quite happy with that. I wanted the sense of a drop off the boardwalk into the, into the fjord below. So I wanted that like, kind of deep green. And to position the camera as far to the left as I physically could, basically what happened was then I could get the, the position of the girders in the white reflection in the water. They didn't interrupt the shadows from the mountains. And as the foreground came forward, I got the white the white wood against the dark drop, and everything came together. Filtration-wise, I used a little stopper to smooth, to bring out more of the reflections in the water. Um, I used a grad, obviously, for the sky, and I also used a polarizer to bring out the, water, the, the color in the water. So the culmination of everything built the image up. So, I mean, the reason why I put it in is to show you the difference, sometimes the challenges, even if you find the right spot, the things that you want to put in the frame, the challenges can be quite uh, substantial. I recently um, went, went round um, Yosemite. And for me, being a lad that had read all Ansel Adams' work by the time I was 18, 19, it was, uh, it was almost like paying homage to Ansel Adams in a way, you know. But I mean, and I, t I tried, strangely enough, you know, not strangely enough, most of the photographs that come back with were black and white, no surprise there. 
Um, but, I mean, it was still a fantastic place. In fact, the place I enjoyed probably more was the Tioga Pass. I'm going over that side. I thought, oh, that was brilliant. This was taken in Mariposa Grove. And when you go to Yosemite, yeah, you do take some of the pictures that everyone else has taken. But you've also got to explore yourself and put your visual signature in, into it as much as you possibly can, which is not easy. It's quite a tall order with locations and, 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 and situations that are so iconic. Trying to make something new if it's not particularly easy at all. Um, we were in the Mariposa Grove, and these are the giant sequoias. And they're, they're not easy things to photograph. They really aren't. It's because it's, they're a real nuisance. They're that big. You know, I mean, they just fill you. If you go up to the table, there's just be a load of bark. They're massive things. So you've got to move away. You've got to explore the environment. And what I rather strangely and counterintuitively, what I found myself doing was uh, working with longer lenses. I had to kind of compartmentalise things that I was seeing. The working wide didn't do it for me, so I was working with slightly longer lenses. And I remember going round and, and trying to get what Mariposa Grove meant to me, what I, what I felt about Mariposa Grove. Beautiful environment, beautiful trees. And the thing that, that really fascinated me was the juxtaposition, the relationship of really, really tiny new saplings, of which there were many, it was quite surprising, um, surrounding these ancient sequoias. Uh, and it was quite fascinating, the relationship between the two things. And so I kind of uh, set myself a task in my own mind that I wanted to, um, to get a composition that made that statement, that, that conveyed that to me as the photographer, and took it away with me. And I was walking around for quite some time, and you know, one of the things I would say, put your bag and your tripod down and just have a wander. And I did this for quite some time, to the point I was almost, there was lots of examples, but they didn't fit the bill for me. And, and it's literally in woodland and stuff like that, you can walk a few feet and what you'll see will be entirely different from over here, you know, it's, and certainly with a longer lens, it's, it's accentuated even more. And I'd walked around and then, as I'd looked through a gap, through, through, a, through a gap in the woodland, I saw this sequoia. Now, the, the basically, that's the base of the sequoia, and the dark area is a burn hole. These, to survive and to rejuvenate themselves, they've got to go through forests. The forest fires help them do that. I'm not saying they set themselves on fire every now and again, but these forest fires, they help rejuvenate the trees. And um, so this had left a huge burn hole, a huge scar in the bark on the front of the tree. And just in front of which was this tiny little sapling growing up, must have been a few years old. And the shape of the sequoia was doing that, the, 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 the burn hole in the sequoia. And the thing that was beautiful about the little sapling was almost emulating the same shape. It was one of the moments that looking and waiting and, and everything came together within a few seconds. You, you ever remember one of them snap moments, you go, that's it, that's exactly it. And that's what it was like. Um, and the, the, the icing on the cake, when we were there at the time, was the fact that the sun was going down. It started, it was late in the day and the sun was dropping down. And as the sun dropped down, the shadow just raised up the front of the sapling tree. And it's just the top of it was illuminated in the, in the shadow in the background. And see, some of these things, some of these moments, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I think part of it's luck. Uh, but part of the luck comes about that I'd actually made decisions on what I wanted to make a photograph of. Right, there's, I mean, oh, not so long ago, I was sent a black and white digital converted camera. And I was converted to infrared. And um, infrared, really, I'd done infrared as a photography student when I was 16, 17, you know. And I got the old Kodak and the Konica infrared films and took them out, I even did it in medium format. And I did the classic that a lot of people do with infrared is, um, is kind of go out there and, and on a sunny day, with blue skies and white clouds, put a polarizer on, the sky goes jet black and the clouds are like cotton wool. Um, and I did that when I was, I'd say, a 16, 17 year old student, photography student. But the point being is that that kind of really harsh contrast thing I grew out of a long, long time ago. I mean, it, it doesn't appeal to me in the slightest. Black and white work, or colour, in fact, have gone and banged on about working in overcast conditions. And so it didn't work, really. I, I, I sort of got it out a few times, took a few pictures and went, pfft, and put it in the bag. Didn't bother with it at all. And then um, I was out, I was, I, was thinking, I was thinking about infrared, and I was thinking, well, it's not just pure infrared light. You know, it's, 
If you've got filters on that, narrow the bandwidth of light that the sensor collects. So essentially they will pick up light, but by having an infrared tinge to it or an infrared influence to the image, the final image. And I started avoiding the very situation I disliked intensely, which is going out in bright days. And I started deploying the camera in the very weather I enjoy photographing in, which was overcast conditions. And this was taken in Westmoreland, not far, but probably about eight miles from here. And it's a great role in landscape. It's not dramatic, it's not big national park stuff, but it's a beautiful landscape. And when I was there, this huge storm started coming in and approaching. It was an electrical storm, actually. And at the time, I had a digital platform with me. I had a 5 by 4 platform with me. And I had this digital infrared converted camera. And I decided, you know what? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to photograph this in infrared and just experiment and see. Try it out, see what I get. You know, I, I don't care if it fails, it doesn't matter. And I photographed it. And the thing that I've liked about using infrared, and I'm just playing and enjoying myself, what I liked about infrared is that these subtle muted tones, it raises the values of the chlorophyll, which reflects a lot of infrared light in the leaves, the needles of the Scots pine trees that we got there. But it's them subtles, it's subtleties of tones. The other thing as well, it brings out great transitions in the skies as well, you know, without the need for filtration, quite frankly. So it was just another one of them moments of exploration and in a, in a sense, another moment of transition for me. And so my work's kind of five by four film, moving into converting, you know, pr digital print, and then moving into using digital platforms, converting into black and white, exploring colour, which I'm thoroughly enjoying doing. And maybe this, just maybe this, is another one of them little transitions that I'm enjoying now. But the point being is that, you know, keep your photography fresh, don't be too so stuck in your own ways. Don't become formula formulaic. And just enjoy what you're doing as photographers. That was the last slide. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Over to you, Tim. Thanks for making us bring out my book. I know. I'm going to take questions off people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, who's got a question for Paul? I've baffled everyone. Okay. Oh, The frame aspect ratio. You you have quite a wide variety there. Um, do you deliberately do that to suit what you think the subject should look like, or do, do you have a preference for sticking within the frame like uh, yeah. some people do? This, this is a question that from, from um, about the aspect ratio of your camera. I know you've worked in 5.4, yeah. obviously, before in large format. Yeah. Um, and you've moved to DSLR, which yeah. is a 2 to 3 format. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, what, what were your decisions about how to, whether to keep 2 to 3? Five four, or go to two to three, or just randomly crop whatever. Uh, well, <laughs> randomly, <laughs> I just crop anything, man. Doesn't bother. No, I mean uh, five by four is by far my preference. I mean three by two is incredibly irritating, quite frankly. I mean it drives you mad using it, you know, because I always think everything's a bit too slim. Certainly, if you work with that many years with five by four. Um, in terms of aspect ratio, I'm quite free with it. I mean, I don't often crop loads of images, but if there's something that I pre-visualised that may be slightly shallower and wider, or it's got to be five by four, then I'll do If I'm working digitally, I'll do that, and I don't mind doing that at all. But I've never been fixed on it, you know, I've never been fixed on it at all. I'd actually, essentially, I don't believe some people turn around and say, maybe that should be a square crop, and I go, well, you can't just apply a square to an image because you think the outside shape might look good. It's down to the content of the image, it's down, what the image, down to what the image is trying to convey. And so therefore, I feel quite free with it. But the, the initial answer to your question is three by two drives me potty, quite frankly. Especially in the vertical. Yeah, in the vertical thing, it, it can drive you mad. You know, utilise it sometimes, and you tend to find that you utilise it because it's there and what, it's what you're forced to do. But there are times where, if you say the D800E, I'll put the crop factor on it because it, you know, it's just the, the three by twos. Far too narrow, far, far too narrow. I think we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, early on, you mentioned.
mentioned metaphor uh, in terms of the jewel on the velvet blanket. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see other metaphors in some of your images as well. I wondered whether metaphor is important in your work. Do you see the metaphor either before or after you photograph? This, this, Not this is about the question that relates to one of your earlier images of the, the ice on the, the black sand. And you mentioned it was about velvet and asking whether you've used metaphors often so, in your work. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes maybe not knowingly. But the point being is, when I, I mentioned before about you go beyond looking at things and you see things. And by seeing things, you bear, you, 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 you're almost like making relations, making sense of it. And by doing that, I think sub, subliminally, you me, you're, making, you, you're comparing that to other things that you've seen in the past. And that particular example was, it was like a jewel in a jeweler's box. And so sometimes, I describe that as that particular example, but... Maybe sometimes it will appear in my work, but not, I wouldn't say often that I use it, no. Not, not particularly. It doesn't guide me work. It doesn't guide me composition all the time, no. Any other questions? Ernie, you talked about pre-visualisation. Um, how much of, when you're taking photographs, are you visualising things in black and white? I mean, are you seeing it in your mind? I'm not asking you if you've got eyes like a dog. I'm asking you if, <laughs> how much you see in black and white. Yeah, this, this question about pre-visualisation and do you, do you see the world in black and white? Do you have, a, do you have that a way to perceive how pictures are going to come out? Generally... I'd say, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been indoctrinated, I've indoctrinated myself, and I see things in form, line, shape, texture, as a black and white photographer would do that. And this, the transition that we've talked about into colour photography, that, that kind of, uh, I still see things in tones of grey, and that's hence the reason why I kind of joked about it, about the introduction of colour was maybe, you know, sprinklings of colour, a little bit of the spice in the image would be colour because I still see things in black and white. And that's incidentally one of the things that people have done colour photography for a long time, and then they're going back to, they, they want to try black and white. That's often the challenge they have. Uh, it, and it's the most difficult part of that transition is that, how do you see things in black and white? How do you train yourself to do that? Because I'd never really done, well, I'd done colour, but not seriously for my own landscape work. Uh, I was working the other way around. And so actually, I don't think it does me any harm to see things in terms of weight, balance, and structure within the image. And then I've got the, the colour to rely on. I'd like to bring the two together properly, which David mentioned earlier on about, about shape, but also the colour. I've still got to train myself in that way because I've not done that much colour work, you know. Any more questions? Quick one for me, Paul. Uh, love the images, uh, and nice to see you're transitioning to colour. I'm wondering if this is disturbing your sleep pattern as you get up in the golden hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's still Saturday, yeah. Because as I said, I like storm clouds. No point getting up. There we go. Is your answer? I'm fine lying in bed in the morning. You know that song. <laughs> Have somebody. No. Okay. Want to wrap up? Yeah, that's fine with me, yeah. No so thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, cheers. Thank you.